All right. Today I am coming to you live from my office, and we need to cover uh, just three quick items. So the first we're going to discuss uh, logical fallacies. Uh, these are things you'll need to know for the final exam. Uh, we're also going to discuss your professional pitch speech, which is due uh, in a couple of weeks from now. Uh, but you need to have it early because you will need to go out and you'll need to interview someone who is currently working a job that you might want. And we're also going to cover your per, uh, your persuasive speech, which is due next week. Uh, don't worry about that one as much. Uh, it will still require research, but it is going to be similar to the informative speech. So you uh, should have a good handle on what's going to be asked for. So let's cover these nine fallacies I have between the next two slides. I just sort of know that um, these fallacies come up in arguments. When two people are debating, what happens sometimes is that someone has faulty logic. So when they're going from point uh, A to point B, the connection that they try to make between point A and point B, it's not a foundationally sound argument. This is called a fallacy. So you want to be able to make sure that you can um, check yourself to make sure that you're not making any fallacies. Uh, and you want to make sure that when you are listening to other people, you might be able to point out some of the fallacies uh, in their arguments to make sure that you are trying to solve the problem. So a few things that I've mentioned in, in class before and I've mentioned in lots of YouTube videos where I've discussed this idea of debates is when two people are debating, the idea of a debate should not be that one person wins and one person loses. The idea of two people debating should be two intelligent, sophisticated individuals who have disagreements. They are debating one another in the hopes of both of them trying to together figure out this sort of third way solution for whatever problem it is that they're addressing, right? So the goal of a debate shouldn't be to win. The goal of the debate should be to solve the problem. Uh, and we just have different people from different perspectives trying to tackle the problem in order to solve it. All right. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're not engaging in fallacies because you want the solution to work and you want to make sure that you can point out your opponent's fallacies uh, because you want to make sure that your opponent is also working towards a solution as opposed to just throwing out different attacks to try to win the day. All right. So we're going to run through some of these quickly. Some of these examples come from the textbook. Some of them I came up with. I cannot remember which ones are which. So uh, I apologize for that and ask you to bear with me here. The first fallacy is known as a hasty generalization. So this is when you uh, stereotype or you exaggerate uh, over generalization. Um, so uh, you wanna make sure that you avoid this. So just because you see uh, a s small population, a small group of individuals within a large population engage in some sort of activity, doesn't mean that the entire population, that entire demographic do engage in that activity. So you wanna make sure you avoid generalizing uh, too broadly. Sometimes this happens in academic research where uh, a, a researcher will um, ask a thousand participants a certain question and several of them answer in a positive way and all of a sudden the researcher will say, well those 1,000 participants, I'm going to generalize that to all 320 million Americans. You've probably overgeneralized, uh, especially when uh, some of the stuff I've talked about in my methods class. Um, most research is uh, most research participants are gathered out of convenience. So if I'm an academic researcher, I'm probably also in college, which means most of the people that I have access to with regard to taking my research are college age students, 18 to 24 from a certain economic or social uh, background, certain, certain cultural backgrounds who uh, value the idea of going to college. So I don't want to say just because I interviewed a bunch of 18 to 24 year olds on their attitudes towards smoking or their attitudes about popular culture or their political beliefs. It's hard to say, OK, I interviewed a thousand undergrads and all of a sudden that means that this statistic that I found applies to 320 million Americans. It's like, no, your generalization probably only applies to specific undergrads at a specific university um, from a specific background of whatever it is that uh, that you were interviewing. So here's a hasty generalization. I believe this one was from the textbook, uh, just because I don't see myself coming up with this example. Uh, but uh, someone might say, for instance, president should have military experience since many of our best presidents were in the military. This might be true, right? So we might hold someone in high regard like uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, right? George Washington. All right. 
Um, however, there are plenty of examples of presidents we've had who are in the military who have not been successful. So in recent memory, someone like Jimmy Carter is seen uh, as not as successful a president, sort of in the modern era. Uh, we've also had presidents who are extremely successful who were never in the military, like uh, Abraham Lincoln. Our two most recent presidents, both uh, President Obama and President Trump, did not serve in the military. Uh, and if Joe Biden is elected president uh, in the next couple of weeks, I'm filming this at the end of October, um, Joe Biden also didn't serve in the military. So people might want to believe that it would be useful if a president served in the military since, you know, that president, a president is commander in chief of, you know, the, the, the U.S. armed forces. Uh, this is probably a president's, you know, number one job. Uh, however, it doesn't necessarily always translate that just because someone served in the military or didn't, uh, what that says about their foreign policy and their military engagement and when they may or may not use the military. All right, uh, false cause. Um, you might have heard the, the, the term before that correlation does not mean causation. All right, and this is where false cause gets at. To be correlated mean, means that two variables are trending in the same direction. Right, both two things are happening at the same time. That's correlated. Causation means that one of those things, right, is causing the other thing to happen, right? So just because two things are trending in the same direction doesn't mean that they're causing each other. It might mean, it might just be coincidental, right? It might just be coincidental. Or what might happen is two things are going in the same direction, and there might be a third variable that's actually causing both of these things to move in the same direction. But these two variables, independent, don't necessarily cause each other to, to move in any direction. So you want to make sure that any time that you're engaged in an argument that you're not attributing a false cause to something that is effectually happening. Um, a fun example of this uh, would be something to the effect of when an NFC team wins a Super Bowl, we have economic growth for the next year. So we'd all, we should always root for the NFC team. The person that, you know, the team who wins the Super Bowl, Super Bowl, whether it's from the NFC or the AFC, doesn't have any effect on sort of like larger macro global economic situations. But it's coincidental that the NFC, you know, just anytime the NFC team happens to win that, you know, we end up in an economic global boom. All right. Um, we could probably rule that these things are coincidental as opposed to, you know, just because the NFC team won the Super Bowl. Um, all of a sudden, we're going to be in this great economic situation. Uh, just for reference, the New England Patriots, who have won many Super Bowls in the last decade, uh, are an AFC team. Um, and so, yeah, it'd be hard to say, you know, when they win or lose or what have you. Uh, some people have done some interesting, like, coincidental things when it comes to weather and patterns and the stock market. Yeah, you know, whether or not we have X amount of rain one year to the next probably has very little effect on, on stock market value. Um, uh, but you know, there's some fun little coincidences you might find, uh, people do this kind of stuff with like numerology, right? They go around and they see certain numbers and they start sort of reading meaning into them as if, you know, there's certain numbers that end up on certain doorways, you know, this is good luck or bad luck. What room assignment you are in uh, probably has little effect as to whether or not you're going to get an A or B in the class. All right. So you don't want to give a false cause to something you want to make sure that uh, you're figuring out whether or not two variables are simply correlated to each other or whether or not they're actually causing each other. Bandwagon means that you don't want to agree with something just because it's popular at the time. Uh, popularity ebbs and flows, it comes and goes. Uh, you see this with sports teams, right? Your team might have a terrible, terrible decade. All of a sudden they get really, really good and they have all these people come out. It's like, oh yeah, I'm a lifelong fan of this you know, team. You say, where have you been? Well, I'm, I'm only cheering for the team now because I've hopped on the bandwagon. They are popular. Everyone else likes them. So I am now going to like them as well. Just because something's popular doesn't mean that it's right. Uh, we see this in every uh, presidential cycle when it comes to the nomination for the party. So in 2016, you had a lot of people who said, I will never vote for, uh, on Republican primaries. I will never vote for Donald Trump. You know, don't vote for Donald Trump to be the presidential uh, nominee for the Republican Party. And then as soon as Trump wins the nomination, everyone goes around in the Republican Party, at least, and says like, oh, I like him now. Right. So he became popular. Right. He won the nomination. And then just like the Democrat Party, you know, just like Republican parties have passed, 
the parties get behind their candidate. Uh, similar things happen with Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. Um, there's a lot of Bernie Sanders people who are like, I can't vote for Hillary, I can't vote for Hillary. Hillary Clinton gets a nomination and the majority of them, not all, there were a couple people who cross lines or there's always a couple people who sit out. But for the most part, everyone jumps behind and says, all right, Bernie was my guy, but now I'm gonna vote for Hillary, all right, because she won the nomination. However, just because something's popular doesn't mean that it's the correct decision. So you wanna make sure that you're not um, supporting something just because it's popular. You wanna make sure that you're supporting something because it's actually the right solution. Red herring is some t is when people start engaging in what are called distractions. So if you think about it, if you're walking a dog, right, and the dog's going in a straight line and your dog sees a squirrel and he, you know, jumps off this side, he's, you know, gets off track. So um, again, presidential candidates do this kind of stuff. So here's an example with uh, Hillary Clinton, um, you know, a, po a possible response she probably would have given. Uh, if someone asked her directly about her emails, which became an, an issue in 2016, she might say something effective like, why are you asking me about my emails? You know, Trump is a loose cannon. We should be talking about Donald Trump. Uh, similar things are happening right now with uh, the, uh, the Joe Biden campaign in the Supreme Court. People are asking Joe Biden and Kamala Harris very directly. Um, if you win the presidency, will you pack the Supreme Court? Will you add more seats to the Supreme Court so you can add more justices to the Supreme Court? And their answer, Joe Biden's answer right now is, why are you asking me about packing the Supreme Court? We should be talking about what Donald Trump is doing in the Supreme Court right now, All right? That fallacy is a red herring. It's like, I should ask you, I, I should be able to ask you a direct question. Will you add more seats to the Supreme Court, right? And you should, you know, that's a yes or no question. Um, so anytime uh, a, a politician doesn't answer your question directly or they start to sort of try to deflect this is what we call a red herring fallacy um where they're not sort of yeah where they're not answering the question ad hominem attack me is a latin phrase which means to attack the person so you have this hom like homo right homo sapien all right so to attack the person as opposed to attack the policy that that person is um advocating for uh and this works sometimes, it, it, it shouldn't, but it works sometimes because we do value a person's character, right? This is that, that ethos appeal, right? So logos, logic, pathos, emotional appeal, ethos, some ethics roughly, but I like to think of it as the credibility of a person. Does that person uphold the values, right? So we look at a person, we say like, that's a trustworthy person. So the fact that they have a good character means that I'm, I'm I'm likely to listen to their advice, right? That's an appeal to me as an audience member. Um, but you wanna make sure that you're not dismissing a person's idea or their message just because you don't like the messenger, okay? So an example of this, uh, in the early 2000s, Al Gore, who lost the presidency to George W. Bush in 2000, Al Gore was Bill Clinton's vice presidential candidate, or excuse me, vice president um, to, to, to Bill Clinton in the 1990s. Uh, Al Gore loses the presidency and he goes around, and he starts doing a lot of stuff with climate change and he writes this, or he makes this documentary called The Inconvenient Truth, which some of you might've watched in junior high. Um, it's going out of style a little bit. So some of you might be a little too young for it. Um, he, I, I believe he won the Oscar for it. Uh, him and some scientists won like a Nobel Peace Prize for it sometime in the early 2000s. Um, and it started to come out and this is pretty well documented i believe abc.com is where I, I i have an example of this for my in-person classes um abc uh ran this story and, and lots of other people picked it up too but said look al gore is going around telling everybody to cut down on carbon emissions and um you know use green energy and save the polar bears and you know whatever right like global uh, global warming is a big deal right climate change is real al gore was doing this whole thing uh, and people started to come out and said, well, I don't know, like Al Gore's using a lot of energy. Like he has a couple big mansions that use more energy in like their garages than I use in my entire house. Um, he's flying around on private jets. He's on these like big yachts traveling around the world with all these like big like tech CEOs. Like Al Gore uses more energy in a day than most people use in an entire year, right? Now, so, and then they would sort of say, well, because Al Gore is a, bad messenger and he's not adhering to his own advice climate change must not be real here's the here's the problem with that you're attacking the person right now is it is it re, like is it a problem if a person who is the spokesperson right is it is should they live up to the values they're trying to impose on everyone else they should right but we also have to make sure that we carefully 
separate bad messengers from the merits of their message, all right? So just because Al Gore does a terrible job at conserving um, or being a conservationist or you know not using a lot of energy, it doesn't mean that his message on climate change is inaccurate. It just means that he's a terrible messenger. Uh, you might do something similar with uh, Donald Trump, right? For three and a half years, almost four years, Donald Trump's been president. And most of the attacks against him are Donald Trump is a horrible person who like should put Twitter down and he says awful things. And it is disheartening that we talk about his character as opposed to talking to his policies, which actually affect us, right? His character is sort of puts his face, he's like the face of America on a national stage, but his policy, like I'm, if, if we're honest, like we should all be more concerned about, okay, what are his tax policies? Uh, what are his immigration policies? What are his foreign policies? Like what's he actually doing that makes like a real lasting difference? Um, and so we're just talking about whether or not we like him or don't like him based on the fact that he's very rude and crude and profane. And, you know, he's, he's a president who uses bad language that is unpresidential. Um, and we're not really talking about his policies. So you want to make sure that you avoid ad hominem attacks where you're just sitting there talking about the personality of the person and you're not talking about the actual um, policies that they're advocating for, the merits of the actual arguments in which they're going after. All right. Um, otherwise, you're going to get caught up in what's called a cult of personality uh, as opposed to actually addressing the issues. All right. Well. OK, OK, uh, my little wand here was free, frozen up, so I think we're good now. Uh, the last slide on fallacies here, um, you want to make sure that you avoid. All right. So these are things you should avoid uh, the either or proposition. Uh, so these are this is what a lot of uh, demagogues do. People who try to just really dig in um, and just sort of do the whole it's my way or the highway. Right. Like you have to listen to me or things are going to be awful and horrible and the whole world's going to end tomorrow you don't want to listen to these people, all right? Um, so uh, a good example of this, I believe this is from the textbook, um, when someone says, you know, we either raise taxes or people will die, right? You either do what I tell you to do or bad things are going to happen. This is a fallacy, right? Because we look at a proposition like that, that people give ultimatums, right? People sort of lay out, like, you have to do it my way, otherwise the whole world is going to end. <laughs> And you start to dig in and you say, well, actually, there's a whole lot of other options here. Like, it doesn't have to be an either or proposition. There's actually ways in which we can, you know, not raise taxes and we can make sure that people have health care. Right. Um, you know, you could take taxes out of other programs and you know, put them towards health care costs. Um, there's lots of other ways to do this as opposed to like we just have to do it your way or, um, you know, bad things are going to happen. And this goes into lots of different political policies. So you want to make sure that you uh, are very cautious of following people who use this sort of either or fallacy. You have to listen to me. You have to give me power. Either you do this thing that I tell you to do or the whole world is going to implode or all these awful things are going to happen. This is a, this is what, you know, a political scare tactic. Uh, again, this is what we call these people we refer to as demagogues, people who only rely on the sort of the scare tactics of emotionally trying to manipulate you. Um, into you know into doing whatever it is that you they want you to do um and that's you know that's political malpractice all right i try to avoid people who want to give me ultimatums uh, there's lots of ways to solve our problems that don't require me giving all my power to one person and their program uh, otherwise the whole world's going to end in like a decade all right so you don't want to fall into this either or fallacy fallacy uh slippery slope fallacy now, this is what's important about the slippery slope fallacy. Sometimes the slippery slope fallacy turns out to be true. However, you want to avoid it because you want to make sure that you tackle the issue that is in front of you. Now, just because someone proposes something that falls on the trajectory of a slippery slope doesn't mean that that thing isn't going to happen. It just means that we got to stick to one issue at a time. Right, so case in point here. Uh, a couple years ago, when the issue of Supreme, uh, the issue of same-sex marriage was in front of the Supreme Court, people would say things like the following: If we allow same-sex marriage, right? If we allow same-sex marriage to happen, then we will have to allow polygamy. All right, polygamy is plural marriage, one man with many wives. Um, there's, you know, uh, pol uh, there's there's lots of sort of poly 
more than two people getting married sort of um, ways in which to you know, define like people sort of have consensual adult relationships. All right. So now, is it does it fall in line with legal logic that polygamy could be legalized? And we could go back to the same-sex marriage decision that was before the Supreme Court. And future Supreme Court justices could use that same-sex marriage decision to allow for polygamy 5, 10, 20 years from now. Sure. All right. That could happen. Okay. So the slippery slope argument might be correct. So it might not be a fallacy in that regard. This is why it's a fallacy as far as the debate's concerned. When same-sex marriage was in front of the Supreme Court, the question in front of the Supreme Court was, can two people of the same sex get married to each other? That was the question. So you, you can't allow people to get off on, if we allow this question to be answered, then all of these other things that we like or dislike are going to sort of fall like dominoes and it's all over, right? Slippery slope fallacy says don't go so far down into the weeds that you forget what is it that we're actually arguing right argue on the merits of the question before us the question before us is for the supreme court should marriage be between one man and one woman or can two consenting adults of the same sex also get married that was the only question in front of the supreme court at the time can marriage be between any two consenting adults regardless of sex all right. And there was people who were taking it and said, look, it's going to happen. Polygamy is going to happen. Plural marriages, you know, multiple people, uh, three or more people getting married to each other. These all these other things are going to fall if we sort of start messing around with the definition of marriage. And the response is maybe. Right. But the question before us right now is just answer this question. Right. We're just talking about two people. Right. That's the only question we need to focus on right now. All these other questions can be answered later, but focus in on the current question in front of us. All right, don't get so far ahead of your skis here. And finally, appeal to tradition and novelty are two uh, different sides of the same coin. Appeal to tradition are is when people come in and say, look, we've always done it this way, and therefore we should always do it this way. All right, so you have um, the example I have here in parentheses is this idea of sanctuary. Uh, so sanctuary is um, a very old concept where if someone uh, is engaged in an illegal act, they can go into a church and claim sanctuary and the cops aren't allowed to come in and arrest them or take them away. Uh, if you ever read The Hunchback of Notre Dame or watch the Disney cartoon, you know, Esmeralda goes into the church um, and Quasimodo claims sanctuary for her. Uh, and you know nobody can come in and sort of take away this sort of sacred whatever, right? Here's the problem with that. Um, we still do that sometimes in the United States. Uh, every few years, especially when we're talking about this issue of illegal immigration, uh, there will be some story, some national story, where it's you know a small family of people who are in the country illegally are living in a church and claiming sanctuary, so they don't get deported, right? Now. This is not a legal argument, right? Right. We have always, you know, in the West, we've kind of respected the boundaries of it looks bad if a bunch of cops and, you know, um, immigration officers kick down the door of a church and go after a family who's in there looking for sanctuary with regard to some sort of refugee status as they're trying to sort of stay in the United States, even if they came in illegally, right? But just because we've always sort of acknowledged sanctuary as this very old concept um it's not a real law all right it's not a real thing that exists we just kind of always done it um and we've kind of always allowed for it because it just feels weird for cops to go into churches and arrest people on issues specifically related to um immigration status all right um so just because we always have done it done things doesn't necessarily doesn't mean that it's right or wrong it just means that we don't want to continue on in, uh, we don't want to say that we've always done things this way, so we should always do things this way, right? It's something that was, you know, involved in like the same-sex marriage dis decision just a few years ago as well, right? It's like, we've always defined marriage as between a man and a woman, right? And yeah, that's 
mostly true, right? Across all like, human history, that's mo that's a pretty good traditional argument. But just because it's an appeal to a tradition doesn't mean that there isn't that doesn't mean that it's the right way to move forward with regard to um, uh, with regard to marriage. All right. Um, so you want to make sure that you're not just saying, well, we've always done things this way, so we should always keep doing things this way. Sometimes tradition should be uh, broken and should be uh, should be uh, we should create new systems. Um, so you don't want to fall into just because we do things this way, we should always do them this way. And finally, appeal to novelty, which is the other side of the coin here. Uh, anytime you say the newest thing that is in front of us is the best thing. So I know that I'm a little behind here, right? So like iPhone 7, we're on the iPhone 12 now, I believe, or they just announced the iPhone 12. I don't know if it's out yet. But when people go around and say like the newest iPhone is better than the old iPhone, the people who stand in line for hours to get the new iPhone, the new iPhone 12, even though they have the iPhone 11, right? These people are stuck in this appeal to novelty and that's a fallacy. Right, just because something's new doesn't mean that it's better, all right? Um, it just means that it's new and it may or may not be better. If you want to ironically uh, look up on the computer, uh, there's an essay by, a, uh, by an author named Wendell Berry who is currently in his 80s. And the essay is entitled, Why I Will Not Buy a Computer. It's very, very short, um, but it's his argument as to why he still writes on his typewriter from the 1950s. Uh, as opposed to buying a computer. So a lot of, he's a very prolific writer. He's written a lot, a lot of things. And people have told him like, you should get a laptop, you should get a computer. And he wrote this essay one day because he's like, look, he's like, just because computers are new with regard to their ability to help, uh, ability to um, help writers, right? Doesn't mean that they're better. He says, look, I've had the same typewriter for, you know, 50 years and it works just fine. Um, and he goes into his list of things, uh, you know, with regard to energy use, Right, it doesn't use any typewriters. Don't use electricity. It's all mechanical. Um, he talks a lot about energy companies. Uh, he gets into some arguments with regard to you know Shakespeare and Dante. Like they did just fine without computers. So don't tell me I need a computer to be a better writer. Um, so yeah, he talks about you know just because things are new doesn't mean that they're better. All right. So these are fallacies. This list of nine I just went through. These are things you want to avoid. And anytime uh, you are in an, engaged in an argument and you hear someone use one of these items, you want to be able to kind of point it out and say, well, just because you use that appeal doesn't, doesn't make it right. Okay. Um, just because you said, you know, something's old, we should always do it. That's not an argument for doing the thing. It's just an argument that the thing is old. Just because something's new doesn't mean it's good. It's just, it's just an argument that just tells us that something's new. All right. So you want to make, be careful not to fall in these logical traps. When you go from point A to point B, you want to make sure you have a firm piece of evidence connecting the two. And you're not just using some sort of fallacy uh, in, in between these two steps. All right, what we're going to talk about now is um, the two speeches you have coming up. So the first speech is your professional pitch speech. And um, oh, this is due in a couple of weeks, and I apologize. I don't have the date on here. Um, it's November something. I can't get out of the this right now without stopping the recording. I had it posted, but then the uh, computer crashed on me and I had to redo this again, so it did not repost. So your professional pitch speech, um, I'll put it in the email I sent to you, uh, but it's due in a couple weeks. And what you are going to do is you are going to give us a five to six minute job talk. So you're gonna treat me and your classmates who are in the room that day like this is a job interview. So what happens sometimes is students go to internship fairs, career fairs, um, they're walking around at a company and they're telling people like, I want a job, but they don't have a short, what we call an elevator speech uh, to pitch themselves, to sell themselves to their potential employers. So they walk around and just say like, I want a job, hire me. And the, uh, the job, um, the, the business might say, okay, why should I hire you? And students get, uh, they're at a loss. So this professional pitch speech is going to help you put together good talking points for potential employers. All right. Um, so you're going to treat us like we are part of an interview. And my job as the professor is to make sure that you are well researched on your job, your career and the company uh, so that you can go in and you can actually have a good conversation. So when we talk about you're going to hear people call it an elevator speech. Imagine if you get into an elevator and you have a one minute elevator ride with somebody who works for a company that you want to work for. 
how can you sell yourself in one minute? How can you intelligently talk about the position, the company, and how you can help the company? How can you intelligently talk about that in one minute? All right, instead of just fumbling around and saying, uh, hi, my name's Josh. I just graduated. You should give me a job. I don't know much about your company, but I'm, I'm exciting. Help me out. All right, you want to have something more cohesive. So that's what you're going to do. You're going to find a profession that interests you. Okay, the goal is, um, of this speech is for the audience to hire you for the job. So you're trying to sell yourself to us. Act as if we are the employers. You need to be specific with your knowledge about the profession. Tell us how you are going to help the company. Um, being specific will help you put together an outline. Discuss the profession. Three main points. All right. For example, point number one, define uh, the profession. Tell us what the profession is. All right. Um, point number two, discuss why you're interested in the profession. Point number three, discuss the future of the company and how you're going to be a help to them. All right. You're not helped to these three generic points, but uh, you do need to come up with three main points. You need to use at least two scholarly sources in your outline during your speech. So, for example, according to some book I checked out from the library, whatever the title of the book is, this profession is the fastest growing profession in the last 100 years. You cite your source, right, just like you have for your informative speech, the other speeches, right? Or, you know, Smith defines this profession as whatever, all right? You only need two scholarly sources. Two, that's it. I'm only asking for two scholarly sources, all right? Define the profession, right? Tell us what the profession is all about. That tells your employer that you actually know what the job entails. Discuss why you're interested in that profession at that company, right? Don't just say like, I hope, I, I, I want a job so I can make money. It's like, I want a job in this company for this reason, right? And talk about sort of how you see this job growing and changing. Um, if you do these things, the reason this is important is because companies put a lot of time and energy and money into hiring people. So let's say a company gets 100 resumes for a job, which is not uncommon, right? They get 100 resumes for a job. Um, they want to know that the person that they hire is going to stay with them for a long time. They do not want you to leave in six months because then they got to go out and hire somebody else out of a pool of 100 applicants. It takes a long time, a lot of energy and money to hire someone. It's very, it, it, it's, it's tiresome, all right? So you want to tell your company for point number three, this is the future of the profession and I know your company and this is where I can see your company growing in the next 10 years and how I can be an asset for it. And then the company's thinking, wow, this person has like a 10 year plan for our company. This person probably wants to be around to help grow the company in that direction. All right. So this is why it's so important to be very knowledgeable about the company you want to work for and have some sort of five to 10 year plan with regard to how you see this working out. All right. Uh, let a company know that you're going to that you plan on being there for a while and you have you have good plans for growing in this profession and growing in this job. OK, so you need two academic sources. You also right as a third source, but you don't need to cite this in the formal way, right? But you do need to contact at least one person who is currently in the profession and ask them questions about the profession. For example, what major is best suited for the profession? Where's the profession heading in the next 10 years? Uh, this interview does not count as a source, but you should say something like, my math teacher from high school, Mr. John Doe said the following. So if you wanna be a math teacher, call up your high school math teacher and figure out what was their major? Like, obviously it's going to be math, but like, is there like a specific field within math? Like, where do they go to school? How do they get their job? Talk about teaching credentials. Where do they think math is going? What's the difference between in-person and the Zoom learning stuff? Like, go and talk to someone who has the job that you think you want. All right. Um, so go and do some research so that you can sort of figure out what major you might need to do, what extracurricular activities you might need. Um, and you also just know how to speak intelligently about the profession. Again, five to six minutes, treat it like it's a job interview, come in and say, um, well, let me show you on the next slide. All right, so the whole experiment here is 100 points. There are examples up on Canvas for you. All right, this is the introduction and th this, this entire example outline is up on uh, Canvas, all right? But here's the introduction, right? So professional pitch speech, right? So you come into your Zoom, the Zoom that day, you give your talk, all right? Good morning, my name is Josh Phillips. I'm applying for the position of university professor. My, why might I want this position? Well, I want you to think about when you were a little kid. Think, you want, think about what you want to be when you grow up. 
We all had dreams when we were younger. For many of those dreams are still obtainable, whether it's a rock star, athlete, firefighter, teacher, et cetera, right? Remember that you know, these jobs are out there for anyone who wants to put in the work. When I started grad school several years ago, I knew I wanted to be a teacher, okay? All right, now we get to the main points. First, I'll tell you what it means to be a teacher. Second, I'll tell you how I became interested in being a teacher. Finally, I'll tell you where the teaching, uh, where, the, where teaching is heading in the future and why I'm the ideal candidate for this teaching position, all right? So your three main points need to be about, I know the profession, here's my strengths and why I'm interested in this job and like, and I know about your company and how I can help grow your company. All right, so we're gonna do this for five to six minutes. This example outline of a more complete full example outline is available on Canvas. Check that out. This is due, I believe it's the second week of November, but check on the, uh, check on the syllabus. Again, I forgot to, I, I had the um, I had the due date up here and then PowerPoint crashed on me and um, it did not save that aspect of it. All right, your persuasive speech. Now your persuasive speech, I know this for a fact, it's due next Monday, October 26th. All right, so you have one week to do this. Now this is gonna be um, easier to put together because this is going to be similar to your informative speech, except you are going to persuade us to do something. All right, so seven to eight minutes, same time length as your informative speech. You should have the same type of material in as far as uh, just as much information, right, in the outline. You want to use what's called comparative advantage. So I'm going to put a link to what comparative advantage means. I have another YouTube video where I talk about it. Uh, I'll put that link down in the YouTube comment section here. Um, but what comparative advantage is, is that when you have your three main points, one of your main points needs to be your opponent's, one of your opponent's points. So you're gonna set up the problem, you're gonna talk about your opponent's solution and you're gonna talk about your own solution. And this should have an apostrophe here because it's possessive, all right? So let's, take, let's talk about gun control, right? The problem, all right, there's a lot of gun violence. Here's some statistics on guns. Talk about the problem in a way that is non-confrontational, uh, that is um, not gonna cause an argument. Right, just like, let's lay out the statistics. Here's how many guns are available in the United States. Here's what, you know, here's how many guns are used to commit crimes and the types of guns and like gun, like just lay out gun violence statistics. Uh, let's say that your solution is, um, let's say you're a pro-gun person. So you might say, okay, my opponent's solution is to get rid of guns and, you know, extensive background checks and, um, you know, get guns, you know, whatever, like get rid of guns, okay? Um, you need to give your opponent, you know, good, uh, you, need, you need to give them a, a good, uh, uh, a good argument, all right? Don't just, don't just dismiss them and say, my, my, my opponent is dumb, all right? You want to say, look, this is what my opponent says, like, here's all my opponent's arguments. So you're going to have to find, like, some sources that actually support your opponent's side of the argument. And then when you go into your solution, which is point number three, now I'm going to tell you why my opponent's solutions do not work, and here's my solution for curbing gun violence. So if you're going to talk about like school shootings, you do something to the effect of, um, you know, we need resource officers or police officers or, you know, teachers who are responsible should be allowed to conceal carry or whatever, right? Um, but you wanna make sure that you show both sides of the issue uh, so that the audience knows that you are well-versed in the whole issue as opposed to just your side of the issue. All right, now for this, you pick something, pick something political, pick something controversial, uh, this is where, you know, this is where these sort of controversial speeches should be made in the persuasive speech section. You need to have five sources, right? Just like your informative speech, again, just like informative speech. And in the end, you need to have some sort of call to action um, where you tell us to do something. Let me pause for a second. When I talk about five sources, you do need to find some sources that support your opponent's side because you're gonna need to have some sources in point number two. All right, so here's what my opponent says. Here's some citations and some t statistics they use. Now I'm gonna tell you why that research is not good research and why my research is better, all right? Finally, in your conclusion, you need to have some sort of call to action that tells us to do something, all right? Now, when it comes to some of these large political issues, um, we not, we, you wanna make sure that it's tangible. So you wanna make sure that you tell us something to do that is small enough that I can actually do it as an audience member. So if you give something, if you give a speech on global warming and climate change, you can't just say like, and go save the planet. Oh, I can't save the planet, right? But you could say like, recycle, bike to work, right? You know, donate $20 to some 
organization that offsets carbon emissions. Uh, vote for a certain candidate, right? Who's like doing some, you know, green energy, whatever. All right. Um, if you're doing something with like uh, euthanasia of like cats and dogs, right? It's like help the humane society. Go adopt a million animals. I can't, right? But it's drop off extra food and water at your local humane society. Maybe go adopt like one animal, right? What are some small things that I can do as an audience member um, that doesn't that isn't overwhelming? And there's good psychological research on this where the smaller you make the problem, the more likely it is that people are going to get engaged. If you make the problem too big, people don't get involved. So when you watch those commercials on TV that say things like, for the cup of, uh, for the uh, the price of a cup of coffee a day, you can help, whatever, right? The reason they do that is because it's a, it's a proven psychological trick that lets people know like, oh, I can afford a cup of coffee a day to help, you know, whatever, right? I can't invest millions of dollars to solve world hunger, but I can do the cup of coffee thing, right? That's manageable to me. But when someone says we need a billion dollars to solve world hunger, huh, I might as well sit this out because I have no idea. I, I, I have nothing to contribute, all right? So make the, pro make the solution for your audience small and tangible, but you can talk about a big issue. You can talk about world hunger. You can talk about global warming. You can talk about whatever, right? But make sure that when it comes to what the audience can do, you give us a call to action that is small and tangible. Okay, a couple quick items here. This is all laid out. This is all on Canvas. These are in your instructions, okay? Find a topic that you can give us a position on, right? You have to take a position, right? You have to take a position. Um, you could tell us to support a certain policy or candidate. The election's coming up. You're welcome to give a pro-Biden, pro-Trump, a pro-libertarian speech, a pro-whoever speech, right? That's fine. Um, it could be an educational topic. It could be a social issue like, you know, legalized drugs. Um, it could be something not as, um, not as political, something like, you know, the greatest football player ever. I actually would encourage you to avoid these sort of fun pop culture uh, persuasive speeches simply because they end up being pretty terribly researched. So someone will say, you know, Tom Brady is a better quarterback than Peyton Manning. Debate. Um, and there's not, there's just not any good academic research behind it. It's just, it's, you know, people kind of pulling statistics off ESPN. Um, and they just end up, they, people try to be funny. Like that's what happens is like, it's just, it's mostly, it's mostly guys, if we're honest, right? It's mostly guys trying to be cute and funny in class. Um, and they end up giving very, very bad speeches because there's just not a lot of statistics and, you know, real research and support behind these, behind these topics. So if you're going to pick something that's, um, that, that, that's not, uh, that, that is more apolitical, like who's the best football player ever. It's probably going to be a bad speech. I would actually encourage you to find something a little bit, um, a little bit more controversial, a little bit more polit uh, political. All right. So I would actually encourage you in that regard. Um, if you do choose those hot topics, right, like abortion, gun rights, affirmative action, et cetera, just make sure that you do a lot of research, right? Stay away from the talking points. So if you want to do a pro-gun speech, fine, but don't be that student who stands up there and says, I've had a gun since I was seven years old. I always go hunting with my family or a hunting family. We have guns. We've never shot anybody, so don't take away our guns. I've had students give that speech before, and it's terrible, all right? It's a terrible speech because there's no statistics to bag it up, right? You can be pro-gun. You can be against gun. I don't really care, right? But what I do care is that you do good, solid research, all right? Uh, research your topic, find five scholarly sources, no www. If I see any www dot whatever, like in your, on your reference page, you know that's bad, okay? Um, stay off of Wikipedia and cable news. Just do good, like check out a couple books from the library, look at your journal articles. You can get this stuff done. All right, um, again, you may need to make sure that you have some sort of counterpoint. So point number one, here's some definitions on guns. Here's a problem about guns. All right, good. My opponent says there's too many guns out there. We need to get rid of guns. Fine. However, I think my opponent's wrong. And here's some statistics about gun control and why it doesn't work. And here's a better solution. All right. Problem. Here's my opponent's solution. And now here's my solution to tell you why my opponent isn't going to work. All right. No ad hominem attacks. Stay away from attacking people. Make sure you just stick to the issue. Uh, and finally, your speech needs to lead to a call to action, which we've discussed. And again, even if it's a big thing like uh, abortion or affirmative action, you know, you could, you know, you can give a pro-choice speech and then say something effective like donate $20 to Planned Parenthood. Um, you could do a, you know, vote for a certain candidate who supports, um, I don't know, 
uh, carbon admission reduction, whatever, right, for global warming stuff. Um, support a candidate who, uh, you know, is endorsed by the NRA if you're pro-gun. Fine. Okay. Uh, but just make sure that it's something that I could actually do. And finally, please keep in mind that um, this speech is only worth 125 points and 75 points, all right, is in the delivery now. So we're moving away from the content creation. My assumption now is that you all know how to make an outline. You still need to make a good outline, but we've been through that now. And now I'm focusing more on emotion. So if you have, you need to have tone and energy and you need to be very professional in this speech. Um, you need to have emotions and inflection and you need to do these things correctly now. You all have seen your classmates give good speeches, all right? Now's the time to stand up, put your camera on, engage with the audience because 75 points is now tied up in your delivery. So if you've been missing points on delivery, which many of you have, all right, because you're putting us to sleep, all right, you're going to lose a lot more points now because delivery is worth a lot more uh, of, of uh, points here, okay? So focus in on your delivery. Make sure you have a solid speech. Uh, this speech, again, is due next Monday, October 26th. It's the same thing. Group one, two, and three meets at six, seven, and then eight o'clock. Uh, everybody's uh, outline is due before class. Five sources. It's the same deal as the informative speech, but now you are convincing us to pick a uh, to, to, to engage, uh, to, you're trying to persuade us uh, to in, engage in an issue or persuade us to agree with you on a certain issue. Uh, that's what we're doing for this speech. Okay, that's all I have for the persuasive speech. Uh, persuasive speech, professional speech. These are the next two speeches coming up. And um, I will see you all next Monday, October 26th, with your persuasive speech ready to go.